All right, I passed uh, 10,000 subscribers, crazy. Anyway, uh, in honor of 10,000 subscribers, I have cleaned my bench. It's clean, <laughs> or at least it's a little area is clean. <laughs> but I figure uh, uh, when I hit 20,000, I'll clean it again. <laughs> anyway, no, it's kind of nice having a clean bench, so uh, uh, this should be good. Uh, but today is kit time, so let's uh, see what kind of kit we have. All right, here's the kit. It is a 13610. Okay, let's get it onto a tray, as they say. Ooh, comes with instructions. All right, what have we got? Ah, look at that. A gas sensor. I've never had a gas sensor before. I don't know what kind of gas sensor, but it's a gas sensor. And we have a little, uh, a little chip on board thing. That's kind of interesting. Last time I saw one of those, it was a doorbell. Um, and then we have the PC board, which is single-sided, but pretty nice quality. All right, let's uh, see what the instructions say. Hmm. They have a gas sensor and it's going into a comparator which then turns on a light. I guess it's like a green light good, bad, red light bad kind of thing. And then it uh, also comes down here to this little thing. So yeah, I think it is a doorbell. <laughs> I think it just, I think it just makes noise with the speaker. So uh, yeah, that's all that little thing does. Uh, and then the rest is in Chinese. All right, let's, uh, let's get it built. Uh-oh, wrong side of the board, there we go. <laughs> Didn't know where anything went. Uh, oh, the values are not listed. So we will be required to use the list. All right, good thing that we have the list. Mm-hmm, ding hao. All right, uh, okay, we have some resistors. Let's start with those. These seem to all be the same value, so. Let's start with those. And they are those weird things that I can't read the codes on. I'm assuming these are 1Ks, but we will have to measure them. You like the way I say measure? Measure. There you go, measure. I like to say measure. I don't know why. I don't know where I picked that up. Okay, these are, hey, I guessed right, 1Ks. I've seen enough of them, I guess. All right. All right. Got interrupted by the wife there. Our anniversary was yesterday. 36 years. 36 years. A long time. And I think we knew each other Geez, like five years before that. So we've known each other a long time. Went to, uh, got out of bed and went to breakfast, which is unusual. <laughs> Actually went to a restaurant. That's really nice. Uh, R6, R6, no masks required now, which is nice. And R7, I had a, uh, I feel like I'm uh, one of those uh, Facebook uh, posts that I just really, really hate. People talk about what they had for breakfast. <laughs> what else am I going to do with soldering down resistors? Um, I had a waffle, which was good. Eggs and waffle. A lot of places are real big on chicken and waffles. I'm not... I've had it a couple of times, but I don't know. Chicken and I don't know. Not my thing. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I cleaned my bench yesterday. It was nice. I, uh, it's, a, it's a big two-inch thick uh, maple 
top, so I actually sanded it as well. I sanded it and oiled it. It's all nice and pretty again. I think it shows the wear being used as it should, but it's better than it was. All right, where do we leave off? R7, R9. We were going to go out to dinner last night for our anniversary, and then we were not hungry. <laughs> so. We decided we would go out to breakfast this morning, and what we would do is just go someplace for a week, every day, either lunch or dinner or breakfast or whatever, just go to a different restaurant one day, one day every day for a week, instead of one big anniversary meal, we'll have a week-long anniversary meal. Sounds like a plan. I met my wife in college. That's how a lot of people meet their other. All right. What else should we do here? We'll find another resistor and measure it. Let me read the color code, see if I can guess. I'd say this is a 330 ohm, but I'd have to be. <clears throat> I'm right. Wow. Maybe I can read the color codes. Maybe these aren't so bad. 330 is R8. Not too many parts in this kit. Right. Next one. Let's see how we do. Oh gosh. Uh, looks like a 50 ohm. I don't know. Weird. This one looks weird. And the answer is oh 5.2 ohm. See, that's why you measure them. It's actually a 5.1 ohm resistor. R1. R1. It's over there. I'm not sure how these gas sensors work. I don't know what the technology is for for gas sensors. I uh, worked on uh, analytes. I worked on fluorescent analytes. So there's a chemical, and that chemical reacts with another chemical, and it uh, binds to it. And then that chemical is, is engineered to have a fluorescent marker stuck at the end of the polymer chain, or the, the, the not, it's, not, it's not a polymer chain, it's an organic chain. There's a fluorescent marker at the end, and if, then if you sign like UV light on it, it glows a certain color, and then you know that your sample has that stuff in it because one chemical bonded to it, and that chemical that bonded to it glows, you know, red or orange or whatever. Analytes, and it was a... Uh, biological project that was um, testing urine. 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 I say, I say urine wrong also. I say urine. I say it's single syllable, which is kind of weird. Anyway, 10K. Uh, which one? Oh, let's measure this one. Um, anyway, uh, you peed on the strip and then it tested like 12 different things in your pee, like uh, See, this is a 220 ohm. 220. Wait a minute. Or 220K. Oh, yeah, it's 220K. That's R11. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So if you're like diabetic or I don't know. Uh, where's R11? 
been going crazy. Uh, R11. Uh, there's no R11 on the board. <laughs> That's kind of weird. How is that possible? Hmm. Check the schematic. Where's R11? R11. Ah, five and six. Five and six. Ah, it goes on this little tiny board. It goes here. Interesting. Okay, I'll do that later. And in the olden days, you went to the doctor's office and you peed on the strip and then you handed it over to them and then they were certified people who could read the code. I guess they had good color vision and they could match the colors and tell you what you've got and stuff. R4. And so they wanted to get rid of the cost of people having to stare at it. And they were dealing with a camera, so the camera would figure out what colors it was and have to calibrate the camera accurately, which is what I could do. I had a lot of experience with calibrating cameras for color theory, making the colors correct. And uh, if you could get it working with a camera, then, well, guess what? Everybody's got a camera in their pocket. It's a cell phone, so you could do it on the cell phone. So you could take these things with you home and pee on them and take a picture, and then it would tell you what was going on. Then it could uh, email that to your doctor, and your doctor could then automatically keep track of your chemical levels in your, in your uh, liquids and see how you're doing, keep you, keep you alive. Went to the doctor yesterday. He says, I am alive. 9012, which wasn't always a for sure, <laughs> but right now I'm in good health, so that's a good thing. I had a, uh, what am I, look, what am I doing here? I'm uh, talking and building at the same time. I don't know what Q, Q1. Uh, I had a PET scan done. I don't remember what PET stands for, but it's, uh, you basically get injected with radioactive iodine, I think it is. Um, and the radioactive iodine then binds or gets eaten. So it's, it's basically radioactive sugar, okay? And uh, it, 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 it's a... Uh, so the, the, iod the iodine is the isotope, but it's bound to a glucose molecule. And then the glucose molecule gets consumed by your body. And whatever your body is, where, wherever your body is hungry, it'll use up a lot of glucose and it'll, it'll then fluoresce. So a lot like the pea strip, it, it, it fluoresces inside your body and then you can do a, a computerized magnetic, not magnetic, but computerized uh, uh, x-ray and uh, it'll, tell you where the glucose is being absorbed. And if you have something like a cancer, cancers are fast growing cells and they love to eat. And they will eat the glucose before any other cells do. And then the cancer sites will show up in the PET scan. And mine was clear, yay. I like the technology though, because I asked the lady um, about the isotope, because I had looked up the isotope, being a physicist, right, I have to go figure all the science out about it. The half-life, I think it's iodine-14 or something, the half-life is a thousand hours, no, a hundred hours, a hundred hours, I think. Yeah, the half-life is a is hundred hours, hundred hours, a hundred minutes, thousand minutes. No, it's in the minutes. It's like a thousand minutes. Yeah, the half-life is like a thousand minutes. It's really short. And, and so basically you have to make the stuff an hour before you use it. Yeah, you have to make an isotope. Well, how do you make isotopes? Well, you have to have a cyclotron. <laughs> 
So you have to have a cyclotron, make this stuff, and then use it within an hour. It's nuts. It's just totally nuts. Um, so I asked him where they got the stuff, and they got it in a town that's like a like a twenty minute drive from here. So they have to like plan ahead of time. So they they have to uh, make the stuff, put it on a car, drive it there, and then quickly use it. So they get really mad if you like <laughs> don't show up for your appointment because <laughs> they've spent all this money um, making an isotope just for you. Um, wow. And, uh, yeah, pretty wild stuff. I love the science involved. Amazing what they can do. I do like medicine. Some of it's very sophisticated, some of it's very crude because it's the only thing they know how to do. But they do the best they can. My doctors have always done the best they can. You have to let them, you have to give them a break. They have a hard job, very stressful. Patients are always dying on them. It must not be fun. All right, uh, let's see here. 10, oh, is it a 104? 104. 0.1, 104. C1 and C2, okay. I remember handling isotopes back in college. I know wasn't wasn't a big fan. I was kind of scared of <laughs> scared of that stuff. But we had to do it as part of our physics curriculum. Down in the bowels of the basement of the physics building was this nuclear 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 uh, Nuclear, it's actually nuclear, nuclear um, lab where you could measure isotopes and stuff. Yeah, I did it and got out as quick as I could. I think the professor was looking for a student to do some stuff, and I was like, no thanks, I want to do electronics. <laughs> do something clean. I don't think electronics is going to hurt me too bad. I might get lead poisoning, but that's about it. All right. Did we get a socket? Yay, we did not get a socket. I'm so impressed. They said, why are you putting sockets on these Chinese kits? Uh, these people are going to build them and then throw them away. Why are you wasting your money on sockets? Plus, if it breaks, just you buy a new kit for $2. <laughs> it's not very much. Somebody surmised, that's a good word. Somebody surmised that the reason they put sockets in kits was because the people who build the kits were using like a wood burning kit and just <laughs> destroying parts by heating them up way too much. That could be, but that's a good theory. I don't know if I buy in, but that's a good theory. Now I can't get the little legs in the holes. There's a crude joke about that, but I will not. I will not repeat it in company. Let's see here. Oh man, come on. All right, while I was talking, the camera timed out, so I don't know where you left off. I don't really care. <laughs> okay, let's see here. It looks like it's a, there's a heating element in the middle and then an input and an output. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah, 5.1 ohm heat goes across the heating element. So something gets hot inside. And then the gas either 
leaks current or doesn't leak current. That's what I think it does. So I don't think it matters which way around you put it. So I'm just going to solder it down. I'm just going to solder it down. Yeah. Live dangerously, that's what I always say. Live dangerously. With self-preservation in mind, though. So not too dangerously, just dangerously enough. I mentioned rock climbing in another one of my videos, and uh, I was on Amazon the other day, and uh, I saw a book, and um, I bought it, and I knew about the book. Uh, the author had contacted me. It's a uh, climber's guide to a particular place in California, and I had written one of the very, very first climber guides in 1974. And he was coming out with a new one in 2000, and I think 20, 2018, I think his book got released. And he had contacted me, and we talked on the telephone, and I described routes and first ascents and names of routes and things. And, and then he wrote his book and released it in 2018, I think, and uh, gives me lots of credit, which is great. So I'm immortalized. Always good to leave leave something behind, right? Leave the world a better place, as they say. So, in the climbing world, I have I uh, mentioned I have a lot of patents, and I got another one last week. So, the way that I know I've gotten a patent is that the people who sell little brass plaques that say Congratulations, here's your... Like they, they give a little brass plaque that's basically the front page of a patent, and it looks real pretty and stuff, and uh, they want to sell you this little plaque. So, of course, they, they're the first ones to... The patent office does not email you the, or do anything. The patent office does not do anything. You do not know that you have a patent unless you, unless you go check. But the little companies who sell these brass plaques, oh, man, they're right there. They tell you right away that you've got a new patent. Uh, so, I got the... Letter in the mail last week. Congratulations. I go, oh, what did I do? So these patents are interesting. They, um, oh, I've got a, I've got a bridge a little distance here. There. Oops. Oh man, this one's hard to, this one's hard to solder to. How come it's hard to solder to? Oh, that lifted up. Oh, damn. Oh, damn, damn, damn. This is a really, really bad board here. Okay, let me be careful. Okay, I'm gonna put it like that. I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the blue tack on it there so it holds it. I think that'll be better. I think I can put my solder blob on there. Yeah. Patents. They're not, I don't own them. Of course, the companies I work for own them. And, hmm. This is not working well. This is hard to do. Let me move it a bit here. There we go. Oops. That'll be better. Yeah, the companies who you work for, you, they are the owners, or the assignees, I think is the correct term. So you can do patent searches, and you can search on assignee, or you can search on inventor. Inventor name. And... Uh, figure out what's going on. So I've been retired since 2014, so why am I just now getting a patent? Well, a couple of reasons. Sometimes it takes a long time to get through the patent office. That's one reason. The other reason is 
even though I'm not working there any longer, I told my boss a bunch of stuff and filed a bunch of ideas. You file an invention disclosure saying, hey, I've got this idea. And they might not get around to, a, to patenting it for quite some time and until maybe they need it, they want to keep it a secret or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, so they keep filing patents in my name, even though I don't work there any longer. How's that? <laughs> they're, they're still continuing to make money off of me, even though I don't work for the company any longer. Bonus. Yeah, bonus. Yeah, they don't contact me and say, hey, we're going to do this. How about we give you $1,000 because we did this? Nope. <laughs> they just do it. Other countries are very, very different. I'd be a rich man if I lived in, in uh, Germany. You get rights to your patent if you're over there. They have better, they have better labor laws in lots of countries. The United States has crappy labor laws. When I was working in the Netherlands, they told me about a law they have that requires them to provide you with a window. <laughs> You're required to have a window. Isn't that pretty cool? I forget. You have to be within 10 feet of a window or something. I don't know. There's some law about windows. I used to work in basements with no windows. So I can tell you that's no fun. So I think we are done. I think we are done. So it says VCC and ground A0 and D0. Interesting. All right. Let's take a look, another look at the schematic before we turn it on. All right, VCC, it's a LM3 something or other. What's the voltages on this thing? Hmm. I'm assuming 12 volts is probably okay. I don't know about the sensor itself though. VCC, does it say anything about voltages anywhere? Oh, it is a lead oxide sensor. Hmm. No, tin, SNO2, tin oxide, hmm, weird. Blah, 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 hmm. All right, anyway, the voltage is gonna change on this thing and it's gonna cause the LM396 to trigger and then you can set the trigger point with this pot and then the LED will change colors and then it should make a sound. The D0 lights up the LED and buzzes the buzzer, so, and then the other LED is just power on. That's all the other LED does is power on. All right. And we have a 1K resistor, which kind of tells you that maybe it's a 12 volt part, nine volts. Let's start with nine volts. I'm not sure about this part. Well, we'll start with five volts. Mm, five volts. IC4. Yeah, we don't know about IC4. There's got to be, be a voltage under somewhere. Uh... Hmm. 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 Ah, we'll just have to figure it out. We'll just have to figure it out. All right. All right. I've got five volts running here already, so let's put in five volts. Uh, ground and VCC. All right. And what do we do? Do we breathe on it? <sighs> hmm. Do we put alcohol next to it? I don't know. Let's uh, let's tweak the tweaker. That's a technical technical way of saying things. But we'll get it right on the edge of firing, and that'll be more sensitive. Let's see. We go this direction. Uh, oh, whoa. Boy, that's obnoxious. Boy, that's a real danger, danger, Will Robinson type of thing. Okay, so we'll put it right there. 
and I will breathe on it. Oh, look at that. It went. I'm assuming it will, will uh, react to carbon dioxide. They usually do. Let's see if we can get rid of it. Will it finally go away? No, it's not going away. So let's, uh, let's turn it off. There we go. Okay, let's breathe on it again. Oh, failed the driver test. Go to jail. Go directly to jail. DUI. <laughs> I don't know. All I had this morning was coffee, so. Wow, it uh, stays on for a very long time. not going to go off at all. Anyway, I think it works. <laughs> I think you get the idea. I'm not sure exactly which uh, chemicals it's uh, sensitive to, but it did work. It did fire. Uh, it might take a while for it to dry out or whatever the chemical process is to reverse itself, but once it fires, it's pretty obnoxious. It gives this awful tone, um, and the LED did, did light up. I could, set, I could set the sensitivity and everything, so the kit seems to work. This kit seems to work just fine, so uh, I won't. I won't go look it up. MQ. Let's see here. Well, maybe I will. Okay, let's look it up. The sensor is an MQ-5. Let's look it up. Can you read that? Uh, the M5 module is good for looking for leakage. Uh, H2 hydrogen, LPG. Okay, liquid propane. CH4, which is methane. CO, carbon monoxide, and alcohol. Oh, alcohol. Okay, so it is breathalyzer. So I failed. I failed my breathalyzer. Either that or I had too much carbon monoxide in my breath. I had too much methane in my breath. Or it's just, yeah, it just kind of relaxed everything. <laughs> oh, they have different types of sensors. So MQ2 does smoke and MQ3 does alcohol. M5 is the one we just looked at. And M9 is carbon monoxide, coal gas. And liquefied gas. Interesting. So yeah, different, different sensors. Anyway, they're kind of interesting. Uh, maybe we should tear this open and, and take a look inside. Hmm. Interesting. All right. We need a trip to the microscope. All right. There we go. See down the top of it. Um, so I've ripped open the top with a little mesh, and you can see there's an element in there that's like a ceramic tube, and there is a nichrome heater coil going through the center of it, so it gets hot. And then there are these two circuits. There's, there's a circuit on the left and a circuit on the right, and I don't know how they're attached to that center section, but uh, but basically, uh, there's some voltage or current leakage, uh, current leakage that happens when the gases interact with that, whatever's coating that barrel in there, that, that ceramic barrel. So the uh, tin oxide, whatever tin oxide does. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, let's see if we can get, let's see if we get a flashlight, get better lighting in there. I don't know if that's any better. That is different. Yeah. Anyway, interesting little sensor. Um, yeah, I don't know what the technology is. Be interesting to know. Anyway, that's what's inside those things. <laughs>